Back again with another episode of the GCN Tech Clinic where I help answer and solve your bike related problems that you leave for me down there in the comment section down below. If you've got a problem, leave it for me. I'll do my best to get you rolling again. Let's crack on with the first one this week. And it comes in from Ryan Thomas. Uh, Hi John, I just got a brand new Planet X RT58 V2 frame. That's a mouthful. Uh, I've got a Shimano 105 group set on my old Ridley cross bike, but it's got non-Shimano mechanical disc brakes. Can I convert this to rim brakes or will it not work? Right then, Ryan, yeah, you will be able to do that because those Shimano levers, those STI levers, are designed to be used with rim brakes, for instance, or in fact, those non-hydraulic uh, disc brakes, so in your case, the mechanical ones. So it's absolutely fine to go ahead and do that. Just get yourself some new calipers, some new cables, you'll be good to go. Probably need to get some different tires as well to actually clear the frame. But I just had a look as well. That Planet X frame, that's pretty cheap, isn't it? I reckon you got yourself a cracking deal there. Good luck with the build. Send us in a photo on the tech show using the uploader tool because I want to see your upgrades that you've bought. Right, next question is from Michael who says, Hi John, I've been considering converting my bike to an electronic group set. It's not DI2 ready, so Michael could use SRAM ETAP, but would prefer to use Ultegra DI2. Doesn't mind if the cables aren't nice and smooth, but it's a little bit worried about the uh, junction box and battery, not sure where to put the battery, and so on. Any experience with this? Is it worth the trouble? Michael? This is no hassle or trouble whatsoever. Those cables can easily be covered up with some self-adhesive strips that are designed actually for that job and made by Shimano. Now you mentioned the battery and where would you put it? Well, you would use your water bottle bosses and actually the battery is mounted onto a long piece of aluminium, or I say long, it's not that long really, and it's just tucked away nicely beneath one of your water bottles and then that cable goes around and joins the junction box underneath the bottom bracket and such like. And well, it's gonna give you great gear shifting. Something you could also consider, I have known people do this and I have also mentioned this in other videos, I have seen people drill holes inside of their carbon frames. Not something I would strictly recommend myself, but I've seen them do it and then thread the cables through there to keep it all nice and internally rooted on a bike that's not designed for it. Uh, but yeah, personally, you can go ahead and actually fit that battery with not a care in the world. It's gonna give you Good gear shifting, in my opinion. Next up is James Baton. Uh, now, James says they recently bought a new bike that came with tubeless setup disc wheels. Uh, they want to use it on the turbo trainer and they've already got themselves a specific trainer tire. Would they be able to buy a spare non-disc wheel and use that purely for on the turbo trainer or do they need to get another disc brake ready wheel? Right then, James, I reckon that your setup is probably with a through axle setup because you've got disc brakes on there and it's a new bike. So it's gonna be quite unlikely you can get yourself a through axle wheel suitable for rim brakes. So get yourself a pretty cheap, in fact, go for the cheapest one out there. That's what I do on a wheel on turbo trainer uh, setup I've got at home because you don't need to worry about the weight because you're not going up hills or anything like that. You're just using it on the turbo trainer and try and get it quite wide as well, because sometimes those turbo trainer specific tires can actually be quite tough to get on because they're made of a really tough old compound, aren't they? So a wider rim generally makes the tire a little bit easier to go on. Uh, so yeah, hopefully I was right there that it is in fact a through axle setup because you won't be able to find, or it's very unlikely, a through axle rim brake wheel. Get yourself a through axle disc brake specific wheel setup. Just don't bother putting the rotor on but maybe on a rainy day, that wheel may come in handy if you were to, dare I say it, ruin your other wheel and you want to go out and use that wheel. Just remember to take off that turbo trainer tire before you go out, otherwise it's going to be like riding on ice. Right, next up is Adrian Knight who says, we all know that tubeless means you can run lower tire pressures without risking a puncture, but is there a performance advantage to keeping the pressure as high as you would in a clincher? Right then, so by having the same pressure as you would in a clincher, essentially you are gonna reduce or remove the chance of any bobbing as you ride along, because when you run a lower pressure and you tend to put a lot of power through, you can then start to bob a little bit, especially on your back wheel where you really start to notice it. Now in turn, that's an increase in rolling resistance, I guess, so therefore you're not gonna go as fast. So by having it as the same pressure as a clincher tire, you're gonna go faster. Of course, when you reach the rough stuff, when you have a really high pressure tire, you start to bounce around all over the place, or you can do, as opposed to when you've got a softer tire, of course you can sort of glide through it a little bit easier. I hope that makes sense. 
What you have to weigh up though, really, is how much of your riding is on really, really rough stuff compared to on okay roads. Certainly for myself, most of my rides are on pretty good roads, to be perfectly honest, with the occasional bit of bad roads, you know, 20 meters of a bad stretch or a kilometer, something like that, if I've been doing some road works. And I wouldn't actually run a softer pressure in a tubeless setup compared to a clincher because generally it's such a small part of that ride that you're gonna make a tiny little benefit from. It's not worth sacrificing on the rest of the ride. I hope that makes sense. Right, next up is Max Revel who says, will nine speed chain rings work with an 11 speed setup? Uh, because they want to go subcompact chain rings and there doesn't seem to be a lot of choice in the nine speed chain ring area without going to a square taper bottom bracket. Whereas in 10 and 11 speed options, they, well, there's plenty of them out there. Right, good news and bad news for you on this one, Max. The bad news is the shifting's not gonna be absolutely spot on and optimized, but the good news is it's gonna work absolutely fine for you there, so go ahead and do it. And I agree with you, you don't wanna go back to old square taper bottom brackets because they're heavy, it's quite old school tech. I mean, yeah, some old school tech's good out there, but square taper bottom brackets, not really ever a favorite of mine, certainly not for road riding. Right, next one is Simone Baradosi, who says, hi guys, really wonderful show, congratulations. I'm planning to buy a cyclocross bike, which I'd like to use in winter for commuting and eventually some bike packing. I'm still indecisive what drivetrain, one by or two by. I'm currently running on my road bike, a mechanical Ultegra R8000 group set, and I'm more in favor for a two by for compatibility issues and spare parts, tools. What's my suggestion? Thank you very much. Right, Simone, I'd be tempted to go two by rather than one by because already you've said you're more in favor of that. So I reckon your heart is going that way. And cycling is all about passion, isn't it? Right, I've got that little bit out of the way. Anyway, so uh, I think that if you went two by to start with, if you did end up wanting to go one by a little bit further on down the road, it's not going to cost you as much money, is it? Because all you've got to do is remove a chain ring, remove a rear derailleur, uh, front derailleur, sorry, rear derailleur, where did that come from? And then put on a narrow wide chain ring and you'll be pretty much all set. However, if you go one by and then want to go two by, you've got to do all sorts of things. You've then got to buy the new front derailleur. You've also got to buy a new front shifter and all those things. Plus, like you say, you're tempted to go bike packing in the future and that can be some long days out there and you may well want just a quite closer ratio cassette so a little bit closer for you out riding and with a one by can be a little bit spread out at some ends of the spectrum there so a two by could well be a better setup for you personally i'll be tempted to follow what you've already said there like i said follow your heart your favoriting at the moment a two by setup i think you know the answer right photo flick schuster has a question and basically their rear derailleur is an old 10-speed Ultegra one and they want to put new 10-speed shifters on the bike. Will the Tiagra 4700 10-speed shifters work? They use them on their other bike and they are just amazing value for money. Or do they have to buy old Ultegra ones? Thanks a lot. Right, bad news here. According to the Shimano compatibility chart, those 4700 shifters will only work with the 4700 rear derailleur. So it's only going to work exactly with that system which is a real shame, isn't it? Because they are 10 speed setups. Now, the gear pull ratio, so the gear cable pull ratio on the 4700 shifters is in fact the same as an 11 speed setup, but it won't work with an 11 speed setup because it's only designed for 10 speed cassettes. It's all to do with the amount of cable that's being pulled and the angle of the, uh, the pivots in the system of the rear derailleur. It's really heaps to go into here, hopefully, We'll have an episode actually coming up soon all about how do gears work, in particular a rear derailleur, but I'm afraid you are gonna have to get yourself a different set of shifters. Those 4700s, they won't work with that old 10-speed Ultegra rear derailleur you've got, sorry. All right, penultimate one this week comes here from Jan Campbell. Hi, I'm a big fan of the show. Disc brake question. Uh, so Jan has got two pairs of wheels for their gravel bike, one more road orientated, uh, one more gravel. They bought themselves some cheap rotors on eBay, new, for a few dollars. Will they perform as well as TRP rotors on the stock wheels or is there a risk? <sighs> right, there's a reason that those rotors are cheap, I guess, like anything in this world. I mean, a few dollars compared to, say, $20, you've got to think about why they're costing just a few dollars. Personally, 
I wouldn't sacrifice or risk my braking by using something unbranded because obviously braking is hugely important and you don't want it to let you down at the worst moment that it could do because uh, that would just not be cool would it i wouldn't go for them i would always go for something branded in your case better be safe than sorry right think about it right final one is from john buton who says question for you john right no pressure here uh they recently bought their dream bike a new bmc they decided to wax their chain and keep everything clean and as frictionless as possible now they're reading they should clean the chain and reapply wax every 200 miles, which could be more than once a week in the heart of summer. Do I see any issues if John was to buy a second chain, a box of quick links and alternate between the two chains? Right then John, this is actually something I'm doing right now on my own bike as we're in the winter months here in the UK. So yeah, I'm actually not taking it off and giving it a full clean before reapplying the wax. Instead, I'm just getting a cloth and putting the chain through it, turning it around a few times and wiping off any dirt that's been attracted or accumulated. There's not, a, there's not a lot, which is absolutely great. I was about to say there's not enough, but that would be, well, lighting the blue touch paper. So there's not a lot of uh, dirt being attracted to the wax on the chain. So yeah, buy yourself another chain and some quick links and just alternate them if you, if you like. Just do it evenly. So try and keep a record of how many miles or kilometers you're putting on that chain. Uh, let me know though, as well, how you're getting on with that wax chain. I found mine, like you say, a little bit noisy, but it's nice and clean and the gear shifting's pretty much spot on there. Right, that's the end of this week's GCN Tech Clinic. So if you've got yourself a question, leave it for me down there in the comments section. I'll do my very best to help answer it in an upcoming episode. And remember as well to like and share this video with your friends, especially if they've got themselves one of those problems I've just tackled, because a problem shared is a problem cared isn't it? Let's face it. And now is the time for caring. Now don't forget to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. We've got loads for you to check out. And now for another great video, click just down here. Yeah, here.